Hi everyone, this is Cindy from Impulse Creatives. We're back for another series of my conversation on Close Encounters. I am so excited and a little nervous today because um, here with us is the creator of uh, TK Story on YouTube, Alex Lind. Hi guys, hi everyone. <laughs> I don't know if your audience knows TK Story. It's okay, we will get into this. Okay. We will get into this. Um, I've been following you actually for a while, actually when you first started the first year. Oh, and wow. I've just been like watching the progression of it and um, and I really love, the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because, well, this time during my stream, I think I wanted to focus on the creative industry here in Taiwan uh, because Taiwan has been uh, a really unique place as because of the COVID situation. Yeah. I think Taiwan has been, is like its little safe haven and you know coming from outside of taiwan and and seeing how the creative industry has been so devastated around the world you know i think taiwan is so special and i and you know during my time here that was my goal with my series is to focus a little bit about this part of the sector right. um which is very important you know and then for someone like you you tell stories mm -hmm. and um in in chinese your channel is called hai ke ju ta and I love even the name of it because it's it really is about the bao gao. It's about Taiwan. It's about the story, the people, and I really love your perspective. And from your angle, it's very not just you know you're not taking sides. You're just presenting us. Mm -hmm. You know you're presenting to the audience what you see mm -hmm. and letting us. I mean, make, I'm sure I'm taking sides. Though. I mean, you you <laughs> take sides, but it's also allowing people to make their own decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what I really like about. It. At least that's that's how I see it, thank you know. You, thank you. And I've talked to a lot of even a lot of my friends here in, in Taiwan and they're like, "Oh my god, I love him and I love, you know, his channel." So I wanted to yeah. to send that your way too. Thank you. You thank know, you. so but you know, without further ado, I'll let just let you, you know, introduce yourself and then we can just kind of just let it roll and see how it goes and ask you a few questions. Okay, so for those who don't know, like I'm the director or also the YouTuber in charge of Taiko Town. And then our, we've been around for about, about five years. At first we were gonna just do, cause my, my background is like, I used to do a lot of music videos. Okay. And okay. I also was a director for like a lot of Discovery Channel uh, videos. And just found out that I think the online is the way to go because more mm. people are leaving TV and watching uh, the internet. So mm -hmm. I started building a channel. And this channel basically focuses on social problems or social issues in Taiwan. And I just wanted to, because being like Taiwanese myself, but growing up in the States, yeah. you have a real identity crisis. Especially <laughs> when a lot of people in the States don't know where Taiwan is. And yeah. then uh, a lot yes. of people are like, 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 yeah, you're Chinese. But it's, it's kind of political, but then I want to be identified as Taiwanese. Yeah. Actually. And then uh, I want, but when you move back here, you find out that you, like a lot of Taiwanese people, they're like, Tongyang. they're like, oh yeah. man, we love Japan, we love Korea, but they don't know what's so awesome about being Taiwanese. Right. So kind of like when I came back here, I kind of want to solidify that thought, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to like make right. people feel like, man, it's damn awesome being Taiwanese. Yeah. We're like, one of the, we're like the first like Chinese democracy, you know, like not like Huaren. I don't know how to say Huaren, but yeah. Like, you know, we're right. like a special place, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it's true because um, I think of you and your channel aligning a little bit similar um, with a company out in, also a YouTube channel company, production company in LA called Wong Fu Productions. I don't know if you know Yeah, them. I know them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and like I ABC, think, yeah. you know, and I think Wong Fu Production, sort of like you coming back, dealing with the topic of identity. Mm -hmm. I think they're they're kind of the same thing. And you know, I still, I'm more there than here, but I go back and forth and I know I get exactly what you're saying. Because I think with Wang Fu, they're trying to help the Asian community's voice. Mm -hmm. What is our voice as a community, right? right? And, and the fact that how do you find your voice and your identity in a very Western white, society mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. though we may have parents that's been there for generations you know for two three generations right right, right? and I think right. I, I kind of see that similarity between your channel and Wang Fu production except you know of course they're also dealing
dealing with identity stuff and um, I think yours is more about the social which I love mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because I've had so much conversations in my part of the world which is touring performing artists mm -hmm. around the world right. and I was talking to several you know artistic directors and the theaters here in Taiwan and I said you know I hope this is actually an opportunity for for the community to look more on their on their artists you know who are the Taiwanese artists who are the Taiwanese performers mm -hmm. because like you said that Tong Yang or the the westernizing you know like I'm always looking to the west because so the Tong, west Tong Yang for those of you who don't know yeah. uh, Chinese yes is to look up to the western exactly exactly the western persona or the yeah. western way right i mean i think in a way you know even us why we moved my whole family moved and immigrated to the u.s mm -hmm. because it's like well the west will have better education we will have a better life if we move mm -hmm. to the west also Which, it has to do with money too. and it has to do with money yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. exactly it also has to do with money so in so many ways we were brought up to say tong yang or the west is better yeah and that kind of reflects into what also you know how yeah you know, a lot of a lot of girls in like Asian countries yes. get plastic surgery yeah to get the the first one you do if you want to do plastic surgery as an Asian Asian woman like that wants to do plastic surgery yeah. is to make your nose, nose a little, a little higher more, right? I know you know, because you want they, they want to look more like Westerners yeah you know, they think or the like eyelids. That three dimensional yeah or the, or the, eyelids. Double, the, eyelids, the double right? yeah the <laughs> double eyelids, double eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> where like the Westerners don't actually get what that is and yeah, yeah, yeah. because they grew up that's how they are yeah, yeah, and then yeah, you know yeah, yeah, before yeah. they could get surgery right. I remember all my friends here and, and cousins and they're like oh yeah you know have you ever used those right. tape like kind of like the Lucy Liu syndrome yeah like, a lot of Westerners love how she looks but then yeah. in, in Asia, they're like, I well, know. she's not that pretty. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The girls that look more westernized are actually the pretty ones. Right, like, right. According to this market right here. Yeah. yeah. And and that's, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, um, you know, it's about identity, about you being in the West, coming back here. And, and it was, I'm really curious, you know, how, like, when did you come back? Or, or come back to Taiwan? Yeah, when did you come back to Taiwan? I came back, like, around 15 years ago, like okay. about right after I finished college. And were you only in like Like I was in the States for like a few production companies, just right. doing a PA, like right, an assistant. Right, right. And then that wasn't really cutting it. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of uh, right. I got another job at, in an advertising agency, okay. but then it was in Taiwan. Okay, yeah, okay. And then I just started there. Right. So was it hard coming back? Like just it getting- It was hard in the beginning because yeah. it's kind of like a language barrier. Oh. I mean, I know, like right now, I think my Chinese is actually a little better than my English right now because I haven't spoken in a while. Right. But then when I moved back, it was so Chinese was so bad. <laughs> so I, I could only just like the entire restaurant, like, oh. like order a restaurant. And, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, but then you know, like being at an advertising agency, we need to pitch ideas. So okay. Like, slowly, you know, you have to mm -hmm. learn Chinese again. Ah. So even though, like, as a kid, you know, you speak Chinese with your parents. Right. So is your reading and writing like fluent reading now? Reading is okay, okay, slow, totally slow. Okay. So when I read like Word documents, like people can't send me paper. They have to send me Word documents so I could use the speaking function. Yes. Like, yeah. So, so, so the so the yeah, no, so the so the computer could read it to. Oh, that's like me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah then, that's like okay, me. Yeah, okay. I and then of yeah. course the the extra yeah. challenge is like I I work a lot in China. Right. And then they send you all in simplified GNT, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, Damn. but then still your your computer can read GNT. Yes, so exactly. Then, okay, so, oh, okay. I, I know I, 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 exactly. So I'm do I spend yeah. so much time like copy and pasting like yeah, my yeah. GNT into oh. Google Translate to right. read in tr in like traditional. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. it takes me a moment. I mean, right. look again. I think it's the same thing like you. Right. You know, my my reading is a lot better than. My writing. I mean, right, I, I right. left Taiwan when I was seven. Oh, okay. Did yeah. you go to local school, like first grade? I only went to public school first grade here okay, in Taiwan, okay. and then. But then Chinese school, right? Chinese yeah, Chinese school. school. Yeah, Chinese local school. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, and then I mean, I was able to maintain my Chinese because my parents expected us to speak yeah. it at home. Yeah, like uh, growing up in LA, there was a weekend Chinese school. Yeah, exactly. That we had all forced to go to. I know yeah. exactly. Same thing in New York. We had to go to like Chinese school on the weekends, and then. Yeah. My mom was like the tiger mom, and she was like, "Oh, that's not it, you know, we'll go how." Right, right. So she 
she had a, a tutor right, right, come right, to her right, house right, right, for right. like 10, 15 but, but years. But a lot of parents just give up, you know. Yeah, my they just, parents they just were lucky. It. Just my speak, parents speak were with your kids. no. My parents <laughs> were really persistent. They right. kept it up. They, yeah, they were like, we were not home. allowed to speak Chinese at home. Okay. I mean, English at home English until at home. like yeah. all the way through high school. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. That's so good. that's why I mean, look, I have her to th you know, I have them to thank. That's good. You know, for me to be able to speak at this now, but um, so when when did you decide you wanted to? I mean, you said you studied film, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I what made film. you decide like you wanted to go into film? Oh, to go, to go back that far. Huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'd love to hear like that transition because you yeah, mentioned you mean, earlier. Like, from, from childhood. Or is it? I don't know. Sure, if there's sure. like, or is I it just one day? You know, I think it's important to talk about childhood. Yeah. Because as a kid, like growing up, my mom bought me like an M1. It's like a synthesizer. Okay. And then me and another friend, like Steve knows, like Chris, Chris Liu, we used to just spend all night, like all nighters, just making songs. Oh wow! So music, music was my first interest. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But then you kind of, you kind of like understand reality and how musicians. It's kind of hard to like be a musician. Yeah. You know, be famous, like make right. money as a musician. You right. Want to find something more stable. Right. And then so. And then in my in my in my child in my high school head, I thought like, oh, film is kind of like music, but it's like with one more track, a visual track, right. but you can also combine music and okay. you can combine writing right. and acting and set design. You know, yeah. there's so many layers. Like, right. so synthesizer, like uh, composing, yeah, is is also layered. Yeah, right? they're very much drum, yeah. bass, exactly. organ. You know, yes. so I like synthesizing stuff. Yeah. So I thought film is even better. So. Cool. Let's, you know, because I wanted to, but then my first degree was in film, actually. Not, not, well, my first, when I transferred, so I never okay. got the degree, I went to architecture school. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then, in the in the middle of it, I thought, like, yeah, it's cool, because I'm creative, I get to, like, design spaces, but I actually want to make people cry. I want to make people laugh. I want to mm -hmm. make people feel. In architecture, yeah, sure. Yeah. If you get, if you're, like, Frank... Uh, mm -hmm. Frank Gehry, yeah, yeah, you can make people, you, you have the budget to like make right. people go, wow, look at this. Right. But then a normal like architect probably is just building like, like schools and right. public facilities. <laughs> yes. Right? And that's like 99.9999% of architects do that. Right. You know? they, they won't be able to like elicit emotions mm -hmm. from like people visiting their spaces. Right. So I decided like, man, I'm just going to, I want to transfer, I want to do film. Right. I want to make people cry and feel. Right. Awesome. That was kind of like the, the trajectory. Nice, nice. So you said you worked a little bit in like, you know, in traditional film, you know, film directing and film production. Yeah. I mean, what led you into saying, well, I think I should just kind of put that behind and just focus totally on YouTube? YouTube. Um, all right. Well, it was, it was kind of like a progression because mm. at first I still wanted to do what I was doing. Okay. Like at first, uh, I was like, how do you say it? Uh, like a freelancer. Yeah. I was a freelancer, but then, uh, so YouTube kind of came along, and I thought like, yeah, I'm gonna make a YouTube channel, but it's just gonna be a collection of work right. that could kind of propel me to get more jobs as a freelancer. Right. So that's how right, it started. Right, right. The intention. Right. I'm gonna like make really awesome videos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because yeah. like as a freelancer, you probably get like one or two gigs a month. Maybe they really suck. Maybe they're just like kind of like a lot of people say it's a service industry because you're serving a client. Yeah. So a lot of times yeah. they won't let you do what you want to do like creatively, you know, right. because they're paying you and exactly. you're the boss. You're serving right. them. But then I, will, in, in my head, I just wanted to make like like content that mm -hmm. would make people go, "Wow, look at that!" Mm -hmm. It's like how the hell are so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but a lot of times you don't get the chance. So I thought, like, yeah, instead of making my portfolio, just create a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like make people know like, I'm this kind of director and I could make this kind of content right. so maybe they'll hire me for like awesome projects that that include my style you know right right right, yeah, right. so that's how it started right yeah so is that why because I've noticed like the first I think the first year right all of your content were very short story based but yeah. like, you were not actually in it yeah because that was kind of what was popular in Taiwan back then like oh. waving right right the right, right, right. yeah okay that okay okay something or like a short story that advertised. Right. Yeah. So all my films back then had actors. Yeah. You know, and then the, 
was still like you know uploading once a week which was totally hard you know because like you had to schedule the actors yeah you know you had you needed time to edit and color right. and everything right and then once a week that was kind of a nightmare you know? so my partner was like a casting person ah okay and then okay. she knew she was also an acting teacher so she knew all the students got it and then, so the students are like a lot cheaper right right of course <laughs> and then they, course. they want their portfolios out too right so, like, right that was really cool that, that kind of collaboration worked back then. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a way, you're sort of giving opportunities yeah, 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 to yeah. the industry. Yeah, yeah Right? Yeah. Giving them an opportunity to also learn. Exactly. And it kind of had that benefit on yeah. both ways. But I would also pay them, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course. De definitely. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. But it's just that you're doing this kind of work to let them have a chance to perform. Are you gonna put subtitles or something? No <laughs> subtitles, no subtitles. So it's like kind of like English Chinese, and okay. you know. So, but I, like cool. I was saying, you know, it's, right. it's it's that opportunity to. It's give. also live. Yeah, and it's also live. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Right. So there is, um, you know. So I think that's that's hard. You know, I think I think in the in the community here in Taiwan, it's hard to give people those opportunities. You know, you you end up just. You end up just, you know, what I've noticed is like whether it's on, you know, the the TikTok or, you know, it's you're the, you're it, right? And then it's your friends that's doing this. Whereas, you're when I saw those segments and I was seeing the credits, like, okay, these are all oh, okay. actors trying to study. And right, right, right. I mean, you may see that, like for example, like you know, with Wong Fu Production, these are all opportunities, right? Yeah. Giving that's the whole that's their yeah. purpose right. is to give opportunities and space and stage. For the Asian American, you know, actors and actresses, right, right, right? and right. I think so you're like kind of doing the same. Yeah, it's right. a women's situation, and I think for yeah. you, like I was saying, you know, going back earlier on, is that this Tong Yang mm -hmm. um, wanting to be Western, wanting to be Western, and you create this this industry of in the performance space. There's so many imports, mm -hmm. right? So many imports of performers and production companies. From the West, mm -hmm. whereas where are the performers and perform, uh, you know, and the performing arts mm -hmm. groups in Taiwan? Right. You know, you don't see them on stage. Mm -hmm. It's like growing up in the U.S. You look at television and it's like, where's my face? Right, right, you know, right. where's my representation? Yeah. Right, and I yeah. think you know, in Taiwan, it's kind of almost in a way aside from television but if you go into the yeah. theaters it's like yeah. why is it all just yeah because basically Western, we're, we're, we were using a lot of theater actors yeah and, and yeah. theater actors don't really get that much exposure right so through the internet right probably. right but then back then we were only getting like 300 to 500 views mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah the second video was kind of a surprise mm -hmm. the second video was like garbage that was because <laughs> like a yeah, the set, the, uh, something special about Taiwan, just to let your audience know. Yeah. Is like when the trash, when the garbage truck comes, they play a uh, for Elise, mm. the music. So every time you hear that sound, da -na 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 -na. yes. People are like, oh shoot, gotta go, gotta go I take know, out the trash. I know. Right? And yeah. you know, I didn't even, I mean, I was only here until I was seven, so yeah. I always know that, but I didn't realize it was like, you gotta run. After yeah, because yeah, they the only trash, for like, like five yeah, minutes. like five minutes, and if you miss it, then you're like, God then you damn, have to I, wait for yeah, two days later, yes, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so for all of y'all, it's not a disrespect mm -hmm. to Furleys, but that's just you know, it's it's like yeah. uh, it's like yeah. what you grew up yeah. listening to, you know, so, it's very so, recognizable, yeah, and so, I love that so, skit. So the video idea was just like a like a ballerina just dumping trash. I know. <laughs> like she was like dancing. You know. I love it. Yeah, and then yeah, the yeah. guy danced with her and he ends yeah. up missing his own yeah. trash. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and then from, much. I know, but even from that, that um, I remember another skit was the mosquito one. Oh, okay. Oh my wow. God. Wow, you followed like really old school Tiger <laughs> Views. I did. I mean, I just, you know, I went online when he told me that you're filming stuff oh, and right, I just right. looked and I started looking at your skits and I thought this is, brilliant and Thank such you. a brilliant way to highlight what's so Taiwan and you know just like you said your 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 stories I mean and you were talking about the social impact was this something that you always grew up feeling like you needed to do like being a social activist or or what what made you feel like this is the direction mm -hmm. 
you wanted to go towards? Wow, good question. Good question. Because <laughs> um, I kind of I know that uh, what I'm doing right now is yeah. kind of sort of like brainwashing. Yeah. Right. Like uh, we watch media to be influenced. Right. 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 And then um, so you can all you can either and having like a Christian background. Right. I want to like I wanted to just do something positive. Yes. I wanted not to betray God. Yeah. <laughs> and then like uh, hey. cuz you know he, Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he gave me like a platform, right? So right. I'm not going to teach kids to like be uh, greedy consumers or you know yeah. so so a lot of my right. topics are about like minimalism, mm-hmm. yeah. environmentalism, mm-hmm. trying to brainwash the kids so that the world can be a more sustainable and better place. Right. Right. So my intentions right. are always, I always kind of keep track, like, yeah, yeah, this, this, will this brainwash, is this brainwashing positive or negative? If it's mm-hmm. negative, huh, maybe I'm not going to upload this, this video, you know? Yeah. Right. So that's always like a, like a checking thing, you know, before right. I, you know, write, write my, right. write my skit. Right, 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 right. No, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, in so many ways, I think regardless of what sectors of the creative industry you are in. It's. I think we have a social responsibility. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. You as a storyteller, you're you're first. You know, you're in the front line, right? So I think that people don't realize that social responsibility kind of really comes with our job. Even mm. you know, I think even with with what I do, right? Mm. Like, I have a social responsibility to. Well, I, I'm responsible to the artists that I represent, to mm-hmm. the performing arts companies that I represent, right. but then they have to be responsible to the audiences that bought ticket to go see them perform. Right. Right. right? So this, right. I think, this is like all a, a mm-hmm. cycle, yeah. and all that that really just kind of all connects. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people always say, well, you know, what is your criteria for for the artist you work with and that you want to represent? And I said, well. I mean, they need to be able to have an impact, a positive impact on the audience. Right. You know, right. because at the end of the day, they're paying money, mm-hmm. right? They're right. they're paying money, and, and and I can't live in good conscience, like, you know, sell a venue, right. right? A performance that's really, you know, crappy. Right, right, right. 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 Um, and and I think you know I've been thinking so much about that sort of since the last couple of years, you know, and so this is, and I think this is why we're having this conversation is like kind of breaking down also a lot of the assumptions and then the, the don't knows or the knows and, you know, like, like, you know, going into YouTube, like you were saying, it was like so hard, even just uploading. I mean, people just don't think, you know, people don't realize like creating even like your five minute or even like a short 10 minute skit takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and, and I mean, I know it takes a lot of time. I just don't even know how long it takes. So, like, for example, like, what is your, you know, what is your planning process? Like, how long do you, do you have to, you know, plan and shoot before you upload? Right that now, video? it's a lot easier. Okay. Right now, it's a lot easier because uh, after my casting partner left, okay. because uh, she wanted just to just, she got pregnant with okay. her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then she just wanted to, cause she was like my only uh, coworker. And okay. Then I had her also carrying equipment. Okay. And everything. So after being cr- pregnant, she's like, yeah. oh, I think I'm gonna switch jobs. You know. <laughs> yeah. And then so I was kind of left with like, man, it's gonna be so tough finding actors without her. Okay. So I'm just gonna turn the camera around and film myself. Ah. Okay. And then back then, I think Casey Neistat was also starting out. Okay. I think so. Yeah, and then so I was like, wow, this guy is making films and he's like a one-man crew. Right. You know, he's acting, he's filming his own things, and then he's also editing. Right. Maybe I can do something like that. Right. And then my first video was, because I live in uh, Tianjingzhi, and oh, my dad, and then that's kind of a place where there's a lot of piano bars. Oh, okay. A lot of host, hostess bars. Got it. And a lot of restaurants, so people like to smoke after after a meal or after yeah. after Jodian or whatever. Yes, and yeah. Then they, there's so there's so many cigarette butts on the, on yes, the street. Yeah. So I made a video just complaining about that. Right. And the video was titled like "Dear Mayor, Co ah. Please solve the situation." Such, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the the thumbnail was just me like, cause that street isn't even that long. Okay. It's like two or three blocks. That's it. And then after like clink like, by myself just like, two hours of just picking up cigarette butts. Mm-hmm. I ended up with a bucket like this big. Oh wow! Of 
cigarette butts. And so that was the thumbnail. So people definitely like, you know, click, clicked in that kind of thumbnail and then like, watched wow. the video and we found out like, whoa, wow, this is awesome. You know? mm-hmm, and, then, mm-hmm. uh, and then because of that response, I was very, uh, I kind of, I'm not like an environmentalist. Yeah. You know, like my core, you know? Right. But then because of the audience reaction, I'm like, huh, maybe I should look into this. Look into this, yeah. <laughs> and then so after that, I uh, I got to know uh, Daniel Gruber. Okay. Who is uh, one of the co-founders of Rethink. And then okay. Rethink in Taiwan, they're like a organization that hosts like beach cleanups every oh, year. Oh, like, okay. You know, maybe 10 beach cleanups every year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then their mascot or their co-founder is actually like a Caucasian dude, like a white guy. Yeah. Yeah, and then he's he got famous because... He was just surfing one day, and, and then right after, like his habit was after surfing, he just kind of cleaned up the beach where he was surfing. Oh, wow! And then, and then Taiwanese people were like, "Oh, look, he kind of goes Yeah, like, I know. They, they, would, they would they would like 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 uh, photograph him. Right, and right. And his pictures would go viral, you know, just like a surfer yeah. like, carrying like trash. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. And then so, yeah, he told me that. Uh, yeah, he. I'm like, like, what do you think you're so famous? He's like, I don't think I'm famous because I, I earned it or I, I tried right. to be. It was because Taiwanese people just wanted someone at this, to, to fulfill this role. Yeah. You know? And then so, yeah, Rethink, uh, I filmed him and then I got to know more and more environmental people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then one of the bigger breakthroughs was as a YouTube creator, like, uh, I think we have a relationship with our audience, mm-hmm, but then mm-hmm. Taiko Ju Tong's relationship with the audience is really close because uh, one time I went to like a beach called Salo in Haipian, mm-hmm. and then it was, it's the beach that's closest to Taipei actually. Oh, you know, okay. It's like a forty-minute drive. Okay, okay. And then wow, it's like a piece of shit. I mean, it's like yeah. it's like it's that that beach was like full of trash. Is it? Oh, like, really? Every step you would see like a bottle, like a syringe needle, like, Ooh, like, like, okay. like fishing equipment. You know? Nets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like really bad, and then so I was just like asking my audience. Mm-hmm, at, mm-hmm. By, at that time, I kind of almost had like a hundred thousand subscribers, and then oh wow, and was, well maybe less. So I asked people like, "Yo, mm-hmm. would you guys want to come to this beach?" And that's the advantage of Taiwan mm-hmm. because it's a really small country, and yeah. then our city is really packed. Yeah. So I asked people to come the next week, and then yeah. two hundred people showed up. Were you surprised? Yeah, and then yeah, and then like, they're all fans of the channel, and then I felt like the most popular guy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but then being like kind of introverted, like I am, it was like yeah. kind of like I had to break through, you know. Right. Yeah, and then right. uh, yeah, I would host like these beach cleanups every year, mm-hmm. and that that first one was the most memorable, you know, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. also like uh my my producer, um who's uh, who who really likes cosplay. Yeah. Like he he knows people he. Like he ha- he knows like that are people who are fans of Taika Town are also cosplay people. So oh, they, okay. they came as storm stormtroopers. Oh to, really? To, to clean up the beach. Oh, that is yeah, so yeah. cute. So that video did pretty well as well. Right. You know. Right. And then so, but then the biggest beach cleanup we ever had was like two years ago. Okay. Like five thousand people showed up. Yeah. How and did you manage one, one beach cleanup? That. Well, also it was a collaboration with okay. Re- Rethink. You know. Got so it. So fans got of it, got Rethink. It. Got fans it. of Taika Juton. Okay. Fans of these other YouTubers, which I connected with. Right, 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 up, right. You know? I mean, how is that? I mean, what's what's the YouTubers community? Because you know, especially since um, since COVID, everyone's mm-hmm. going online. I mean, I think right. in Taiwan it's different, and even now, I think you know, I think for those that are coming on, is because they are starting to see the the trend mm-hmm. that's happening. You know, like once COVID hit, no one can do anything, right? Mm-hmm. From the creative industry. Like in LA, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, the performers, places. performers, actors, all of that got stopped. Yeah. So everyone's going online to, um, to upload, to stream, to live stream, to create contents online. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much you watched it or like what your you know what your thoughts are with these people sort of now kind of coming on um i mean you really had a purpose you were very clear like you know even from day one you could mm-hmm. see you know going from filming other stories to turning the camera to yourself 
that message never, you know, that that sort of that your focus never changed. Mm -hmm. And I For think a lot of creators, a like, lot of creators are sort of yeah. confused, you know, and yeah. um, especially like if they're like a travel channel. Yes. Yeah. They, or the, they would, I know like a travel like like Lil Pei, like Pierre. OK. And okay. He, he used to just do travel. Travel okay. vlogs yeah. in Chinese, so right. people like his audience is mainly like Huaren, you know, like oh, Hong okay. Kong, Taiwan. Okay, and then people would just follow him to like Europe, Germany, wherever. Mm -hmm. you know? But then during COVID, he would only get to travel in Taiwan. In Taiwan, yeah. right? So he kind of switched it where yeah, his vlogs in Taiwan became it became English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you know, he would probably like kind of entice people to come to Taiwan. Right. Yeah. Right, so right, his right. his direction kind of changed. Right. Yeah. Right. But then definitely he wasn't able to do as well as before. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So for you, I remember um, during I think when you were doing the skits, you had like subtitles on yours. Oh, you mean English subtitles? English subtitles. subtitles yeah. For some of them, for the ones that are like more like like classic Taika Ju sound. Yeah. We would probably put English uh -huh. subtitles. Yeah, because I saw, and then later on when you turned the camera on yourself, it was just totally purely. You know, oh, yeah, Chinese. Yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. was what was the decision on that, or when you decided, you know, like, because for me, I'm I'm live streaming, but with the intention that you know, I'm not just gonna be live streaming here in Taiwan. So once mm -hmm. I leave Taiwan, right, right. I will continue my series and have conversations with different peoples, you know, in different parts of the world. So English is still gonna be my main, main, yeah, main language. Main, main language. Yeah. Um, but for you, you know, you had that kind of back of, you know, you had a bit of that decision making and, and when you went to stream, you know, when you turned the camera on yourself, you decided I just going to do it all, you know, what right. was your, what, did you even, you know, when, I, I don't know how it is for YouTube, con you know, like how do you think about where your audiences are? Or, right, right now it's yeah. just not economically viable. <laughs> oh, okay. Got right. it. <laughs> right. For example, if you wanted to get English subtitles on the video, you could do CC, right? You right. You could do CC okay. on YouTube. Okay. But then that would take how many hours, right? And oh, that okay. would take, who, who's going to, who's going to translate it? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then if you look at my Kotai, my YouTube studio, only 2% okay. of the views come from like the U.S. Oh, okay. You know, okay. So you could kind of kind of figure out like only, you know, you know, like a two percent mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the ad rev if you divide it. Okay. That's okay. not gonna that's not gonna pay for the person like yeah. how much money I would have I got to pay it. the translator. Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we are talking about stats. So then, our majority of your viewers from then all total pretty much from Taiwan. Ninety ninety percent. Oh, wow. Ninety-five okay. percent are Taiwanese. Okay. And there's okay. some from Hong Kong, some from the U.S., some in Japan. Oh, okay. But then I would I figure like there's just Taiwanese people, Taiwanese that, people are, that are living abroad. living abroad. Yeah. 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 So it's like yeah, it's Chinese. It's gonna be in Chinese. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So was it hard? I mean, you said you were so introverted, and then you decided to turn the camera on yourself. Was that? Oh, that process. Yeah, that process. I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard. At first. Um, I would just, and also my Chinese is also not that fluent. <laughs> well, now it's a little better, but then before. No, she's a good, yeah. Oh, thank you. But then before, I would just do it line by line, and I would have a lot of B-roll. <laughs> you know, so when you film something line by line, yeah. you just insert like really cool edits. Okay. And then if if you edit it well enough, then people think like, wow, this guy speaks. Well, <laughs> but it's probably like multiple takes. Like, oh shit, I messed up. Yeah, multiple, exactly. Multiple takes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, for uh, for those that are joining us now, I'm here with Alex uh, Lin, the creator of Taiko Ji Tang, which is a really popular uh, YouTube channel here in Taiwan. Um, please send us your questions if you have any. Um, you know, come ask us any questions you have, anything about filmmaking, any anything about tips, you know, if you want tips on how to make better YouTube videos, you know, please come and ask away. Um, you know, talking about just getting used to that, you know, even for me, in my job, I have to do a lot of like pitchings, you know, because yeah. I'm trying to pitch my artists to different programmers and different festivals and theaters. Yeah. And we have what we called, um, booking conferences or festivals where you get to go, you know, if your project of your artist is selected, you get to go and do a pitch. And, you know, for me, that was like easy, right? Mm -hmm. I know, you know, write something and I go on stage, I talk about my project and, and, 
you know, usually the artist would send me like a video and then they just hit play and then I'm done in like five minutes. And of course, with COVID, all of these, all of these festivals are starting to go online. Mm. And I had to start to learn how to create these videos, right, which right. was just like, <laughs> Oh, so you're talking about the difference between like a live audience versus like a phone, right? Yeah, like on a phone. And yeah. literally, he was my cameraman, and I would have to like. It was just like a, you how, know. How how did you think it was different? How, how do you how do you think it's different? Because than I'm talking, talking to a real person. Yeah, like talking yeah. to a real person. I have I could see people's expression, what they're thinking, and I you know. But then this is like I'm talking to nobody. Right, right? right, and I'm like, what well, am right I now, saying? Right now, it's easier because you're talking to me. Because right? I'm talking to you. But if you're talking to like a phone by yourself, it's really hard. That was yeah, so exactly, hard. Exactly, exactly. It was so hard, and then yeah, I it takes was a like, long time, yeah. and it was, you know, all our videos had to be just like less than three minutes, right? And that just like took me hours. <laughs> and <laughs> right, right, same here. Same here. And it was yeah. just like, oh my god, this is hard. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know. Yeah. So was that yeah, kind of the like same experience for you at the yeah, beginning? Yeah, it was, it was. And yeah. I had like no, you know, and of course I'm just like, I don't even have a film background, but we right. are all forced to do this. And right. thankfully I have, you know, but, I have a But team. you're also, you're like a speaker, you know? I mean, I guess, you know, I think it's, I And then even so for you, I know, like, right. like going from like a real audience to like yeah. a virtual audience, it, it was kind of a stepping stone. Right? It was a stepping stone. Right. It was so hard. And then. You know, my colleague would, you know, he had a bit of a film degree. He studied a little bit of film. And so yeah. he would just be like, you know, schooling me on like, right. well, you need to make sure your phone is horizontal, right. not vertical. And I need this in this, you know, mm. spec. And I was like, what is this? I'm so confused. Oh, right. <laughs> Probably one of the, be the best advices I've, I've heard on YouTube was yeah. just to imagine the phone or the camera yeah. as one person. One of your oh audience. really? Okay. Yeah, okay. Just talk okay. to that person individually. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, but then you have to have a really good imagination. It's true. Yeah. It's true. It's I, kind I mean, of like those actors that act in those uh, CGI movies. I know, right? With the that's green, true. With the green yeah, screen, that's, they have that's to imagine true. like, oh monster. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of like that, and you have to imagine like, oh, you're some audience that that loves you is right in front of you. Yeah. They want no, to it's true. To you. Yeah. It's true. It's true. I mean, yeah. you know. Again, I think Taiwan is so unique, and I think everyone had to, even teachers, yeah. right? Even teachers had to engage with their students virtually on a video, on yeah, a little screen. I couldn't screen. imagine that that kind of learning process would have been pretty hard. It's it's just challenging, and it was the same experience, right? I was. But have you talked to teachers? Because I, I talked have. I talked to some, and they yeah. said that experience is way harder than live yes. teaching. Totally. Like totally. after one hour they're like so tired yep very yeah. much so yeah. very very much so yeah. because you know they also some of their curriculums and some of their lessons had to be pre-recorded right and they just said it's this exact same thing I can talk to a bunch of 30 you know I can talk to a class of 30 without any problems mm -hmm. yet try to record that same lesson would take like hours right right you know yeah so it's 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 been a really interesting thing and even kids yeah. You know, now, you, I mean, you'll probably, I mean, look, with Taiwan, maybe it's a little bit different, but I think, you know, just using my son as an example, mm -hmm. he's learned how to, like, you know, take videos of himself, and then, you know, he had to, like, upload all of that to the school so the right. teachers can review his work. Right. And it's like, wow, is that, like, it's, the next, it's the next, next talent, thing, right? The talent it's the next thing. Like, they all know how to do that. You know, they're, like, yeah. so easy. They're so equipped now, like, how to self like take selfies yeah. take photos of themselves and point. how to like you know shoot videos of like how to um you know say certain because he had to he had to record his task and mm -hmm. all his assignments and right. then send it in and you're like okay i guess they're learning to be filmmakers i guess yeah the skill of filmmaking is going to be kind of like the skill of writing right right like it's, people who don't know how, how to write they're kind of at a really huge disadvantage yeah yeah. right now but in like 20 years people who don't know how, how to video make and edit mm -hmm, are going to mm -hmm. be at a huge disadvantage right yeah. right no it's it's true and then you know just and you know hopefully they'll learn to be really great you know storytellers but you know i mean going back to how you tell stories and how do you decide like okay when is my next i mean you gotta you're basically uploading content every week right like how long do you have to plan in advance for all of these 
these topics or or what really you know like I kind of I kind of think like most creators you okay. probably have a list mm -hmm. and then when you have time like before I, I had almost every day to like go for a walk and just okay think of ideas yeah you know and then just write it down right and there's, so there's gonna be like a pretty huge list and then I also have another forum where people can just send in like ideas oh for, okay for, okay for documentaries got it. Uh, or so social issues that they're yeah. interested in and they just right. post it there right right and sometimes right. we go on that website to see like mm -hmm. which ones are like executable yeah within a week <laughs> and, then, and then we, we just go for that so do yeah. you really just film those topics in a week and then upload in that same week um there's like a backlog okay but then right now there isn't one <laughs> yeah yeah wow I know sometimes oh. the backlog kind of mm -hmm. catches up, so right oh. now I'm kind of yeah, taking a break. Okay, so we have a question from, oh, Dev Shab. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Cindy and Alex. A question for Alex. I know Taiwan has improved <laughs> on bettering environmental issues, and I know this is an important topic for you, so I'm interested in what your opinion is on what ways the local government can better improve regulations on this issue. On, on environmental in issues? Environmental but but issues. there's so many. <laughs> like uh, any <laughs> so what the government can do huh what the government can do I mean from all that's your that's a really beach, hard question because well like don't. let's say like from a beach cleaning and then even just this whole concept of like you know cigarette butts that's such a big question <laughs> because the cigarette butts is really like the problem of consumers mm -hmm. obviously you can outlaw cigarettes but that's not going to happen Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I used to think that, I used to think that the government could do something mm -hmm. about, like just talking about cigarette butts, I used to think the government could do something, but right now, I think they don't have power to do anything. <laughs> I, I don't think they have, I think uh, you have to influence the consumers. Right. And then, uh, like for the cigarette butt thing, there's like a bunch of... There's like a, I have another video idea for the cigarette, but yeah, I'm like, and then uh, like the rethink, which we talked about yeah. just then, they actually have a video where there's they they bring like a fishbowl to Shimen uh, Ding, which is like a really popular place. Yeah. it's like a fishbowl, right? Okay, and then they go just go to people who's, who are smoking, uh -huh. and then when they're right 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 when they're about to throw it away into the into the sewer, yeah, they just. Like just just put it here. It's the same thing, you know. The girls just put it in this fishbowl. It's the same right, thing right. because if you if you kind of understand the sewage system, it just goes directly into, into the, the ocean. Into the ocean, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're thinking about a video where we're gonna put a GPS on a cigarette mm -hmm. butt and then fall, fall <laughs> into the ocean or something. Oh my god, yeah. that would be so cool if yeah. you could do that. Yeah. Well, actually, this is something that I I actually was thinking about and really kind of, you know. Um, during quarantine yeah. because coming you know we we had to be quarantined and then our meals were sent to us you know three meals a day mm -hmm. and then you realize that because of court because of COVID one thing that you know they said um, because of the pandemic mm -hmm. the um, the air in a lot of places you know cleared up right. a lot of you know uh, wildlife that never grew or was dying out kind of yeah, came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oceans, parts of the oceans cleaned up. Right, right. But simultaneously, what I realized is that because of COVID, you can't go to restaurants. Right. But right. people are starting to right. order in. Mm -hmm. So then I'm looking at all of these bian dang that's been delivered, all the food that's been delivered to my room. Like the packaging. The packaging. Like containers. The yeah. containers. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not into the environmental stats, but like, I don't even know like the amount of these packages that have increased because of the pandemic. Right. You know, because of all the, all the takeouts, because of all the Uber Eats and all right. the, you know, food panto right. deliveries yeah, yeah. that are sent to you. And, right. and even though they may say that, you know, my packaging right. is, is recyclable, like, so there's good and bad, right? Right. Like the, it, yeah, the exactly. The carbon emissions probably went down. Went down. The food containers went up. The trash went up. The trash went up, or like whether those kind of containers, you right. know, is that actually good for the? Are they actually using the 
the proper containers that are actually good for the environment because we right. you know we don't know well, I think, um, I think that's a really good question, though. Okay, so Stephen now says he wants oh, okay. to see a tracking disc. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? Yeah, I want to see that, too. <laughs> we got to find, like, a waterproof GPS. There's no waterproof GPS yet? Um, well, maybe you can make it waterproof. Make it waterproof. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, so ask away, people. Ask away. I mean, like, what has been your favorite story that you've done? these last mm -hmm. five years like what has been something that you feel was like I, I really you know this is really probably one of my like favorite stories wow um, I have a bad memory so maybe my last video <laughs> <laughs> hey that's fair enough that's fair enough that's fair enough right. I mean what has been the most challenging part then like of, uh, of the like last, um, well let's say out of all the, you know, because you actually go and experience. And I think that's another thing is that you're not just talking about it, but a lot of the conversations or the topics you talk about and you, you film about, you go and physically experience mm. it yourself, right. which is unbelievable. Like the, you know, from being just sleeping on the streets right. versus, and also the last, the latest one you went to, you know, mm. sort of, Okay. experience the elders right, you know right, like right. the how do they say that in here in taiwan the the, the uh the duju lao ren. Duju lao ren. so um i guess is that a so the duju lao ren is like these elders who live by themselves who don't have family that really care yeah, for them yeah. but they're not they're not in a um they're not i guess in a nursing home or or a caregiving facility but mm -hmm. they're still they just live alone they live alone and their relatives are yeah. probably far away in Taipei or something right like they're like in Nampu or something right right yeah so I mean what are, what are those experiences like I mean how were you able to you know like how how did you convince them to say I wanted to do this and I, let me live in this actually apartment? the uh, <laughs> the old person the the Du Ju Lao Ren video okay was initiated by them oh yeah, okay they have okay. a hotel which kind of let you experience what it's like to be a Du Ju Lao Ren. Really? Yeah, there's a hotel. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, you can't eat anything there. It's, there's no internet. You know. Wow. And then you can't. You have, there's rules. You know, you can't go outside. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, I'm checking into like a prison. You know, but they want you to experience it. Okay. Because like Du Ju Lao Ren, they're not gonna go outside because what if they forget their keys inside or what if they mm -hmm. trip. They right. don't want to go outside, and they have to make you wear these glasses, uh -huh. where you can't really see that well because that's how they see the world. Wow! And all the TVs are broken. And so they recreated this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for yeah. Others, just to experience just like to what experience. it's like. So it's kind of like a like a foundation, like a teaching hood. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so they invited me to make a film about it. That's cool. And so you know, well, we get a lot of opportunities after you know doing a lot of of course work. i'm sure i'm sure so that kind of makes it keeps it rolling you know yes yeah, and right right we don't right. Really have to think of that many ideas mm -hmm. they just come to us yeah yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah and what's i mean how but then the, you, you ask like the hardest yeah the hardest one like in, in my mind it's probably like the homeless episode right like where where like me and uh, two friends we yeah. were home we, we we tried we were just experiencing like the homeless lifestyle for like three days Oof. you know i did it by myself for one day that was really hard right I'm like oh three days oh my god it's gonna be really hard but then let's do it so i went with my pastor yeah and then i went with another guy and then this other guy i met when we were beach cleaning oh okay and then he he's like a, like like a really hardcore fan of the channel mm -hmm. but then i found out he used to be homeless really yeah, he used to be homeless as a kid Oh wow! Yeah, wow. So he's like, yeah, sure, let's go. I, he's like, I totally know the people there. Or whatever. <laughs> you know? right. I, right. I know the lifestyle. I've been homeless since I was like eight, you know, till like twelve or something. Wow. You know, homeless for four years. What's that gonna do to someone, right? Totally, yeah. totally. So well, I, I mean, got, I got the yeah. pleasure of knowing. I got, you know, I got to know him even more, and then we got to be homeless. <laughs> it, was really, it was really hard yeah and then uh i had to beg for money at one point because i thought well 
Well, back then, I think some people kind of knew who I was. Oh, okay. But then it was still kind of embarrassing. It's like, yeah. oh, do you have like 20 NT? Like, I, I need to go to right. like Taipei Sazan. Or I need to go yeah. to like Huasa. Uh, what, what's the homeless place? Like, uh, I forgot. Okay. <laughs> And then I, I need to go to that place to meet right. my friends so we okay. can like. So is there a area where the homeless yeah, here in yeah. Taiwan kind of gather? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Longshan Si. Oh, Longshan Si. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And then so in, at that park, there's about 50 homeless people there, and we kind of joined the community for mm -hmm. three days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think as an Asian culture, right, because of our up, whether you're Chinese or Korean or Japanese, as Asians, you know. I don't think we really allow our families, you know, to be homeless, right? Like no matter what, I uh, think. And then compared to like the West, you see, you know, homeless is almost like very, they're in your face everywhere you go, especially in the major cities. Mm -hmm. And you don't really see that as much. And I guess I'm just curious when you were experiencing that for three days, like what was your take away sort of like the views of the homeless from from the other receiving end like what is what do you think of people as like in Taiwan see as view homeless people you mean how non-homeless people yeah how non-homeless homeless people? people view them I think compassionately mm -hmm. I think I think but then also people in Taiwan are really busy mm. and so they don't really have time to like to help them you know people are so busy helping themselves right and then I think I think that totally makes sense, you know, because a lot of people are also struggling. They're probably not homeless, but they're struggling. You know, they're right. they're, they're spending all their salaries, right. so they still need to keep working, hoping to like save enough money to invest and then mm -hmm. kind of like have a nice old age. You know, I think I'm still trying to do that. You know? Right. Like, yeah, I don't have enough money to to, to make a passive income. I I, I don't make money in my sleep. You know. Yeah, so, of course. So. Of course. Yeah, I think like in general we're compassionate about homeless people. Okay. But okay. then, and then the homeless people in Taiwan, they, they don't ask for much either. I mean, right. when you're in LA, they have a sign like, "Yo, man, you have five yeah, bucks." Yeah, exactly, man. exactly. This is what I'm yeah. saying. Like, or and then people you know, in Taiwan, they're like, they're like, they don't say anything. They're just like, really? they okay. just hold like a bowl. Like, okay. Yeah, they don't even say five four five four. You know, mm -hmm. but people there, there's these uh people on the. On the freeways that sell like, like a yulan hua. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They sell flowers. They're, they're just a little more like taking the initiative and like knocking on windows. You know? Right, yeah. right, but right. But homeless right. people, they're they really, yeah, not really. You know, and then when we got to know a, a few homeless people, they're mm -hmm. really nice to talk to actually. Yeah. They're like really chill. Right. And then a lot of them used to have really cool backgrounds. Okay. You know, they just got homeless somehow. Yeah. You know, they just lost money. Some right. of them were probably bosses. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And okay. They're just in that kind of situation. And then a lot of them, like, you hear their stories, like, man, you were homeless for 10 years already? Mm. So this guy I met, he was, uh, he had, like, a, uh, like a crutch mm -hmm. and a wheel, uh, a crutch and a wheelchair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he was homeless since he was, like, 13 or something. Now he's, like, 23. Oh, wow. But he had a big smile on his face. Yeah. You know, he loved talking to people. Right. And then... At night, they would just settle in their cardboard boxes, mm -hmm. like what time good night, I'll sit down. Yeah. Good you night, know, yeah. You're not cold. You want, you want, you want a blanket. Right. You know, they're just nice people. Right. You know. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So w during, I mean, when you were filming this segment, I mean, did you was there any studies that you were doing to say what were the s statistics of like who were, who were the homeless people? What makes, I mean, like in the U.S., you know, there's always there's this demographic, and then there's this. this statistics of okay who will most likely become homeless and really? homeless people you know are generally a makeup of certain race age uh, and background right. I don't think so I don't think we have that kind of statistic that okay. kind of labels people that are likely to become homeless mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there was that there was one statistic that said that every month four to eight people die Oh, okay. In that homeless community. Okay, okay. You know, because of disease or mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like not 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 having good hygiene. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also we also got to explore like facilities, government okay. facilities. 
Like okay. we could actually take a shower. So for like on the second day, you know, I was mm -hmm. feeling so dirty, so I took a shower mm -hmm. at like a government facility. But that place is like pretty trashy. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, really trashy, and then people are just like sitting there waiting. Right. There's a lot of depression too. You know, people are just we right. went to like a homeless church. Oh, and okay. All the members of the church were homeless. Right. And then I think like mostly because at the church they got to serve they, uh, people serve bian dang serve, yes serve they're food. serving food right and then after right. food you're welcome to join our service okay and so we ate their food yeah. hungry too right yeah <laughs> and yeah. then we went to the service right you know, which was like really good you know yeah. right 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 yeah. no I mean that was I think it's just amazing that you're you know you're willing to put yourself in those experiences oh, okay you know I think not. I haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, similar sort of types of uh, videos like your channel that would do that, and um, and it's you know it's it takes courage, you know. Like I mean, you're not going into simple <laughs> like easy situations, and most people right. probably well, would. I choose. think like a lot of people are curious, right? You know, wouldn't you be kind of curious? I would be curious. Explore that side. <laughs> I would be. I mean, told, I mean, I would be curious, but I don't know if my ego would be like allow me to just sleep on the street. I mean, uh, just or maybe like or like even my OCDness would be like, yeah, would I be yeah. okay sleeping on the street? You know, even if I didn't care, but it's like it's mm. really hard to fall asleep because right. like uh, you know you're used to having a roof over your head, right? And then it's kind of hard to fall asleep in public because mm -hmm. who knows like. Some guy might come by with a hammer just right, smash and your smash face, your face, you know? right, yeah. or just come and steal your thing. Yeah, so you like definitely for all three nights we had like s like sleep de de deprivation, deprivation for sure, you know. Right. I don't think I fell asleep. I think it was just like right. You're constantly, <laughs> constantly yeah. Constantly like, oh, what's that you're sound? You're constantly yeah, trying yeah, yeah. to like protect yourself yeah, mentally, right, exactly. and subconsciously. Yeah. But then the other homeless people, they're used to it. They're, they're sleeping they with babies. Think, you right. hear so many people snoring like. <laughs> you know? But then, seriously, that place is like all the homeless people. They're like pretty much next to each other. Right. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, like cardboard boxes. Uh -huh. We had to. We had to actually make enough money to buy the cardboard boxes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then to futon, you know, so wow. we could sleep on the boxes. Uh -huh. It was actually kind of soft, you know. Yeah. Right. 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 So was it hard to get some of like your, you know, to, you know, because some of the subjects you gotta have to go to those people and. Was it hard to try to convince some of your subjects to say, "I really want to come and, you know, come and film you," and you know, and would it, would you be okay? Um, you mean to let us to do to do that? You mean filming the homeless people or filming ourselves? Just in general, you know, like like for, for example, okay, like how did you convince Andre to go to Raw and to like oh. I'm gonna get like food from the food bank, right? right Is it right, right. would that be considered food bank in Taiwan? Right, like when you right. picked up those um, almost expired. Well, Andre is pretty cool. So okay. Andre is like a Michelin chef, right? Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So so yeah. if you don't know, um, Alex did a segment with um, Andre, which is a Michelin star chef of a very famous restaurant in Taiwan called Raw. And, um, but instead of even just asking him to cook at his kitchen, like Alex and his team went and collect food at different food banks and brought it to him and said, can you cook us like a right. Michelin star meal yeah. out right. of these almost expired food? And I was like, wow, how did you even convince him to do that? I think uh, if you wanted him just to cook a normal meal, right. like, just to get a reservation right. at his restaurant, it would be even harder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I think he's also an artist, right? True. So he kind of wants to do something challenging. Challenging. And he wants yeah. to do something that has meaning, and that has meaning because he's using food that people normally think is like, ah, oh, just give it to the poor, you know, like, oh, it's like a defect product. We're not right. going to be able to sell it, so put it at a food bank. Right. And then we're just kind of bringing awareness. It's like a good cause. Exactly. So, right. So he totally agreed. You know. Okay. But it took a while. Okay. Because we proposed to him like six months before oh wow okay yeah. okay like my producer thought that was a good idea so okay. we kind of wrote the proposal yeah and so they kind of agreed but then it would take some time mm. you know for him to for his schedule to clear up okay yeah. okay okay cool yeah. and what was like are there any topics or people you wanted or subjects you wanted to film that you just haven't been able to like success like who like 
let's say in your dream, like what would be, you know, one of the next group of people or top topic you really, really wanted to talk about hmm. or to cover? Yeah, I gotta think about that one. But then one of them is going to Africa. Like I oh, missed wow. my chance to go to Africa. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. just to kind of really. Why Africa? Poverty. <laughs> Poverty. I mean, we're all so protected, right? And then like, just to see the, just to see that like, and we, you know, all of us have seen like, we are the world, <laughs> and then like the Ethiopian babies, right? Right. But then to actually like get to know them and talk to them and to, mm-hmm. and to get that perspective is rather is so real because we're all we're all living in the, in the one percent bubble, you know. Yes, we are. You know, like even in Taipei, I mean, of course, the U.S. right, yeah. the richest country in the world. But Taipei is in Taiwan's not so bad either, right? No, it's right? not so it's bad. Not so bad either. <laughs> right? It's totally not so bad. I mean, yeah. I'm. Well, you know, you you had right earlier on in the pandemic, right? You did a you did a um, a segment and going around interviewing like what happens if Taiwan had had to shut down. Right. Oh, right, right, right. I remember right. that. And right, it was, right, right. and you know, people kind of didn't really think about it. And then, I'm like, how do you not think about it? And then coming here this time and talking to you all my friends, like, oh, and you're like, you, you don't think about no, it. No, of course because, now you don't think about so it. So we're totally living in a bubble. Right. right. And I was yeah. like, you know, in so many ways, I keep thinking like the always the good and the bad, right? The good thing is it is really safe. Yeah. You know, you, you really like to say that it's surreal to feel normal is weird mm-hmm. right but then you but at this on the flip side you're like oh my god you guys are living in a bubble the rest of the world is definitely not like this right 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 and and you're like is that a good thing or a bad thing right right you know and, and i don't know if you've yeah. thought about that because for me i think about it almost every day especially mm-hmm. if i'm going out every single day on the subway talking to people meeting people and just the fact that I'm doing a live stream sitting here with you face to face. Yeah, it's face like, to face. It's like without without face without masks. face masks. <laughs> you know, like the first time I came to Taiwan I had a face to face meeting. I was like, oh my well, God, okay, I don't even know. I had to like right retrain my brain of how to have a meeting in person right. because the last literally the last seven months I've had like so many Zoom calls my brain is right. like you know like right. That's the norm, right? Like I've seen people in little boxes, and all of a sudden I'm having meetings in person. It's just like, wow, I had to get used to that again, you know? Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts? You know, when you did that segment, you know, like I mean, of course you don't, you know, you're also living in this bubble, so you don't know, you haven't been, you haven't left. Yeah. But what's your observation and and you know of like people here in Taiwan? dealing with a pandemic versus well we're not allowed to leave so we don't really know what's going on so and uh, we kind of just watch the news Mm -hmm. and well i kind of watch even more news because like i can watch english content as opposed to most people in taiwan right right Uh, but then yeah i Mm -hmm. admit to living in a bubble and what was your question again like what, what was my i mean what are what are your thoughts about just like you know what do you think about when you were out there asking, like, what do you think? You know, do you think this is a bad for people here in Taiwan? The fact to, to, to just live in this bubble, or or is it just there's no other? You know, it's just the way it is. I mean, you're saying you're trying to, inf- you know, you're trying to brainwash them. So, is there a way that people can be more aware, or is this something that you just can't really relate to because you're not in that situation? The latter. The I can't latter. really relate to like yeah. being in lockdown because I've never been in lockdown. Right. Yeah. Right. But then you know, obviously, you know, talking to friends, you're like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Like, what yeah. is it like not being able to leave your house in six months? You know. You go a little yeah. stir crazy. Yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you go a little stir crazy. <laughs> so you know, my perspective is through friends. Right. Who that's, you know, my a lot of my friends are kind of lucky. Yeah. They, they still have their jobs. Yes. Like I have that one friend, Mike, mm-hmm. and then he still has his job, but then he chose to move to a different location mm-hmm. because he had to work from home. So why yeah. not move to somewhere bigger? Yeah. But then the house is in a less uh, expensive location, so he could own a bigger house. Own a bigger house. But he found out like since this COVID thing is not gonna end probably yeah. soon, mm-hmm. I might as well live in a bigger place so I don't like get so angry. 
yeah. with, with my family members, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, we need more space, you know? Well, I yeah. think this is why real estate around the world is not going down. You know, oh, okay. it's actually going up instead. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's actually People going up. Live in bigger places, well, yeah, right? because yeah. they're all forced now to work from home, and then a lot of companies have decided that this is a good, a new format right. for us. Right. Right. Um, you know, and so most people are now looking to have bigger spaces, like you said, so they're not on top of each other and they don't kill each other. <laughs> right, right. So they can't go anywhere. Right? No, they can't. Yeah, they can't go they anywhere. They can't go take a breather. Yeah. Well, we have another question. It says, hi, Alex. Which of your proposals have been rejected when you approach people for filming? Proposals that are rejected. Huh? Yeah. Um, good question, but it's hard to... I don't have a good memory. <laughs> um, but then I could talk about some cases, especially those with the, uh, how do you say, gong um, Governments? Yeah, the government the sector, government? the public okay. sector. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't even rejected. We filmed it, and then, like, towards the end, they didn't want it. Oh, know? really? So we spent money on it. Okay. You know, but they couldn't pay us because there's so many levels of hierarchy yeah yeah so like the commercial company thought it was a good idea right and then they actually the public sector they they came up with uh you know because what, what you, you were saying with like the uh, food panda and yeah. uber eats yeah and then there's a there's a pc home in it's kind of like amazon yeah yeah taiwan pc home and momo they came up with a xun huan dai right which was which like you know, after you get the package you have to return the package Right. You know, so you can use it many times. Right. So it won't just pile up as traffic. Right, right. And then we did a video on that. Yeah. And then, like, the go the one of the government officials just didn't agree with the storytelling and told us to change a bunch of stuff. And I thought if we changed it his way, then it's not going to be Tiger Jiu's town. It's not right. going to make any sense. Right. You know, so we were going back and forth, and finally, right. we they were tired of it, and we were tired mm -hmm. of it, and mm -hmm. we just couldn't put it on YouTube. Right. So that that video is kind of still in my hard drive. Oh. And then we couldn't get money for it. You know? Okay. But usually the proposal is just like usually they kind of just look for us and like yeah. hey we want to do a video with you. Right. And then right. please give us a script. And then, okay. Like, and then they okay. they agree or if they disagree then we ask them why and then we kind of change it. Okay. If we want to if we want to keep working with right. them. And then, right. And okay, right, green right. light. We'll start filming. And then usually it gets done. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So are there any other, like, I mean, you say you have, like, a big laundry list, you know, of, like, topics and stories that you wanted to do. I mean, personally, what are some of the, you know, now that you're talking so much about these social impacts and the environments and then mm -hmm. um, these social s subjects, you know, what is, what sort of is more closer to your heart that you, you know, filming these yourself of course you know from covering all of this stuff that you cared about or you've started to take notice on to just learning all these different sectors of areas I mean do you feel like there is hope do you feel sometimes you know disappointed do you do you feel like you know like pessimistic I mean what is your I mean you know these are all really in a way they're very heavy subjects some of these you know and yeah and you know what is your you know what is your takeaway after you upload these videos? I mean, do you feel hopeful? Do you think that that there is you know, jiu or like you know that there is there that we're we're salvageable? You know, <laughs> like I mean you know because to me, when the pandemic hit, you know, I literally said to so many people, I said, you know what, basically all the gods. It's so weird because you're you. I mean, you brought up the pandemic like so many times yeah. in this interview, you know. Yeah. And then for me, living in Taiwan. Yeah. I found out that bringing up the because I, I talked about the pandemic. Yeah. Like a lot of t many times. Mm -hmm. But then I would find out that the views on those videos would keep going down. Right. People in Taiwan just less and less interested in the right. pandemic because right. it's not happening to us. So right. Why bother right. watching right, right, more right, content right, right. about it? Right. But in so many ways, yours is almost like it's a buildup, but you've been talking about it. And I think, you know, from us as an outsider coming in to look at, at, your, at your stories, I think it's even more relevant and it's even more in your face. Because I kept saying that, you know, 
it's your highlight of it is sort of a, a, a spotlight on us saying that we are, you know, as humans, we are not the, it's, we are here where we are because us as human beings, we're not, you know, starting to get too greedy or not taking care of our earth. Mm -hmm. And this is why I kept saying, I think, you know, the upstairs had an executive committee and decided mm -hmm. that we all need to be taught a lesson. Oh. <laughs> which is why, okay. which is okay. why this happened, right? Right. right. Whether right. from a small, you know, from maybe some less impactful to really, really, you know, to the extreme. Yeah. But you know, so so I think your story maybe to the outside world actually resonates even more because you've been talking about it and you've been highlighting these issues that really needs to be, you know, looked at. Mm -hmm. um, so. So I guess it's an interesting like, thought. I never thought of it that way, though. I mean, if you yeah. think about it, this is really the only thing that's happened to the entire world, right? That's that's impacted everyone. There's mm -hmm. there's no one that is left behind, right. basically. You right, know, right. I mean, even even I'm sure even Taiwan at the very beginning of it. Yeah, like recently, you know, we've been having. Some and then scares now there's it. little yeah. scares. So yeah. so no one is you know no one is unaffected. Um, it's just the degree. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like from that, you know, um, your your social. I think we're content. just. I'm, I think we or, I think I'm just being kind of like, what do you call that? Like ignorance is bliss kind of mm -hmm. mentality, you know? Like mm -hmm. yeah, just don't bother thinking about it until mm -hmm. it happens. You until know? it happens, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we do have another question. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Deb. Kudos to Cindy and Alex for both your platform and for sharing your experiences and stories. So interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, I, I mean, I want to end on a positive note and just yeah. congratulate you on all of your success and, and continue, continue to tell your stories. I think it is so Thank important, you. even if it's only in Chinese and, right. <laughs> and to let you know that, you know, you have a lot of fans out there. Um, I've spoken to so many people and they're like, of course. And you know, actually one of my friends was like, you know, yeah, like he, he, she was just such a huge fan of yours. And, um, and you know, she's like, oh my God, he's like one of the rare YouTubers and, and, and storytellers that's really trying to do something positive for Taiwan. So Thank just you. wanted to pass that along. Thank you. That but means thank a lot. you, Mo. Thank, thank you, thank you so much for your time today. It no was, problem. <laughs> you know, I, it was such an honor to have you on and to just, you know, to have this conversation with you. Cool. Okay. So thank, <laughs> thank you, you so everyone. Much for thank me. you for joining us. Don't forget to check out Tai Ke Ju Tang TK Story. We will. We've posted the links on the, you know, on our Facebook, and so please go check it out. And um, we'll see you next time. Have a good night, have a good day, have a good afternoon wherever you are. Bye, peace out. Bye-bye. <laughs>